uh, Tuesday, Thursday session on strategies to support the COVID-19 response in low and middle income countries. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, today, uh, and it's an honor for me to introduce uh, Chris Beyer. Uh, Chris is the Desmond Tutu Professor of Public Health and Human Rights, uh, and he, uh, his primary appointments in epidemiology in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. He has multiple other titles, and uh, those include the Director of the Center for Public Health and Human Rights, uh, the Associate Director for Global Health, co-director of the Center for AIDS Research at Johns Hopkins, uh, and uh, some honorary uh, and quite responsible uh, uh, activities such as uh, being president, past president of the International AIDS Society. Uh, and many of you know him through that connection as well as many of the uh, other uh, appointments. And he's also a member of the Institute of Medicine. Rather than go on uh, uh, with a prolonged introduction, I uh, want to be able to turn this over to Chris. Uh, he's going to be talking about um, human rights uh, and uh, public health strategies uh, for low and middle income countries. And we're all looking forward to his talk. I will remind everyone as he speaks, if you have questions, please include them uh, on the chat box. Uh, and we'll try and answer them as he's going, um, but uh, some will reserve uh, for Chris to answer at the end. So I want to welcome you all, and I'm going to turn this over to Chris Beyer. Chris, it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tom, and uh, greetings, everybody. I uh, hope all are well and safe. What I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, maybe a, a somewhat different aspect uh, of COVID-19 and the response to COVID-19, uh, which is the human rights uh, aspects uh, of both the pandemic and the response to the pandemic that have emerged and are continuing to emerge, uh, and that really challenge uh, the response on a number of fronts. Uh, so thinking about, for example, social justice, discrimination in the response, uh, the uh, burden and impact on vulnerable populations, and the role that governments have played, sometimes uh, very positive roles in protecting uh, human rights in the context of an emergency like the COVID-19 pandemic, and sometimes, uh, unfortunately, rather more harmful ones. And we have seen this before in response to other emergencies and pandemics. It is not unique to COVID, uh, but it is because we're having such an extraordinary global pandemic. Uh, nevertheless uh, powerful and important. And it's something that everybody involved uh, in this response um, really, I think, needs to pay attention to. So let's jump in and I will start sharing my screen. Uh, and give me a moment to pull up. Okay. Uh, there we are. Okay, I'm not finding my talk. Hmm, hold on just a moment. And while you're doing that, I'll, uh, yeah. uh, Baki had greeted everyone on, on the, in the chat. Um, uh, I was remiss. Uh, if you have questions for Chris, uh, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And Chris, I think I have a copy of your slides if we need to share those, or Megan will. Well, it just makes it a little hard to, um, all right, screen share. There we go. Okay. So 
How is that? Can people see those now? We can. You can Great. go to full screen if you want. There you go. Perfect. Really. Okay. So as, uh, as Tom said, I'm uh, delighted to have served as the Associate Director for the Center for Global Health, which is, of course, hosting uh, this wonderful series and for which Tom has been the founding director and continues to lead. Uh, and it's really been marvelous uh, participating. So I'm just gonna start with a, a few basics about the human rights framework for health, uh, because I think for, for many, um, it's just important to, to, to cover the essentials. So the first thing to say about human rights is that the framework is a universalist framework. These are not the rights that we have as citizens of any given country. Rather, these are uh, the rights for which there is and has been since 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was put forward, a global consensus that these are the rights that we all share by virtue of our human status. They encompass the broader area of civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights and freedoms, but it really is broader than that. And, and the fundamental basis of the human rights framework is human dignity and the worth of the human being. Right. So there is also spelled out in the Universal Declaration of 1948, the first international assertion of something like a right to health. It's in the, uh, the uh, Article 25, which is about a, a right to an adequate standard of living. So remember, this is 1948, so the language here is a little bit gendered, uh, health and well-being of himself and his family, but what you are meant to understand from that is everyone. Um, and it asserts that there's a basic right to food, clothing, housing, uh, and medical care, uh, necessary social services, a right to security uh, in the event of unemployment. Think about that in the context of what is happening uh, in so many countries with mass unemployment and COVID, um, and, uh, and also a right to social protection. 1948 is really the beginning of this Universal Declaration, uh, the beginning of, of the modern human rights movement, but the Universal Declaration, which is a wonderful aspirational document, if you haven't read it in a while, do read it again. It is really quite, uh, quite an amazing aspirational goal for humanity. Uh, but it had no enforcement mechanism. And then there was a long period, essentially the Cold War, where there were very few advances on this front. But in the 70s, in the period of detente, we had finally some real advances in human rights. There was a covenant on civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights, both of 1976. And in that, uh, in economic, social, and cultural rights was an assertion of health rights, and it included the prevention, treatment, and control of epidemic diseases. So in the international human rights framework, there is uh, a right to protection from epidemic diseases. There have then been subsequently other conventions and treaties uh, on the rights of women, for example, and the most widely ratified of all uh, is the 1990 Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, so uh, this is just a, a, a sort of a framework for uh, where we are in human rights. What, what does it mean if a state agrees to one of these treaties, if we sign on to the International Covenant on Social, Cultural, and Economic Rights? Well, what it means is that governments are committing to make progress on three fronts. The first is respecting the right. And what that means is the state itself is not a violator. The state is not gonna violate the right. So for example, if you sign on to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, you cannot use child labor for a government project. Right? So that's respecting. The second is protecting the right. So if you sign on to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, you can't let anybody else in your country, like a private company uh, or a local governor, uh, use child labor because child labor is not a part of the International Convention on the Rights of the Child. And finally, fulfilling the right, and this is where most of public health will go and where much of the rest of the talk today will focus on, fulfilling the right. And this is about trying to make measurable progress. We understand that not everybody can, for example, resolve the issues of gender equality overnight, 
but governments who sign on to the Convention on the Rights of Women need to make measurable progress and have, have milestones for achieving that progress to achieve gender equity. Now, when we talk about emergencies in public health, you immediately see that there is a tension between individual rights and liberties and the need to balance protection of the public, right? And so in international human rights law and in public health governance, there are a number of state powers that can be invoked in the name of protecting the health of the public that can restrict our individual rights. And those are things like isolation, which essentially much of the world is living through right now, including all of us on this uh, virtual talk. Uh, quarantine. Right? Quarantine is a, is a marked restriction on individual liberty and freedom, uh, but it can be uh, invoked to protect public and to control an epidemic like COVID, and even forced hospitalization, which, for example, was a very prominent feature of trying to control MDR-TB and XDR-TB, uh, as many will remember. Uh, so, so there are particular powers uh, and there are particular responsibilities. So just as an example, in the West African Ebola outbreak, this really was brought to the fore there was a recognition on the part of the medical community and the public that rights and freedoms needed to be temporarily limited. There also was a public demand for protection. Right? And that's a very important state function. And then there emerged issues of fear and stigma and social harm that also is happening with COVID. A great example would be the the uh, stigma and discrimination against Asian Americans in the early phase uh, of the epidemic, uh, including people who had no connectivity to China or to Wuhan at all, but nevertheless were being stigmatized simply because of their ethnicity. And the government, any government, has a role to play in dealing with that fear, in reducing that fear, in dealing with stigma, in trying to control it and implement measures to reduce it, and to protect communities from social harm. So there are responsibilities and powers that both are in play in the response to a pandemic. Now, fortunately, uh, because of this issue, we have had since 1984, a framework for dealing with how we restrict rights and freedoms in response to an emergency. And this is the Syracuse Principles of 1984. Syracuse is a city, um, a city uh, on the Italian island of Sicily. Uh, and this was basically a convening in 1984 of human rights and public health. And it was co-convened by the World Health Organization and by the UN Committee on Human Rights, UNHCR. Uh, and this was to talk about and come up with a framework for limitations on human rights and civil liberties for public health goals. And these really are the core operating principles and uh, let's go through them together. Uh, and then going forward, we'll look at what has been happening with COVID and you should, if you can, hold on to these principles and test the response against them. This is really the key issue. So the first is that these restrictions or limitations must be provided for and carried out in accordance with the law. They have to be lawful. Right? And, uh, that, that, and, and most countries have a legal framework in which to do this. They have to be directed toward a legitimate objective of general concern, of general interest, right? So for example, uh, going after a political opponent under the guise of responding to COVID-19 is not a legitimate objective. Reducing new infections, uh, improving clinical care, those are legitimate objectives, right? They have to be strictly necessary in a democratic society to achieve the objective. So one of the things that happened, for example, with the response to the Ebola outbreak in Liberia was that initially the government of Liberia quarantined an entire 
community, a slum community. Uh, and it was seen as an overreach. It was seen as not strictly necessary and it quickly broke down and it actually cost them more lives and more infection. So uh, these restrictions must be what are necessary to achieve the objective. They should be the least intrusive and restrictive to achieve the objective, right? Uh, so that is an important component. They should be based on scientific evidence and neither arbitrary nor discriminatory in application. And this is extremely important, right? We have already seen and we'll talk about some examples of discriminatory application. Uh, and of course, that both undermines human rights and threatens the response. Right? So based on scientific evidence, neither arbitrary nor discriminatory. And finally, they should be limited to the time frame that is required to achieve the public health goal. They should be respectful of human dignity. So upholding the fundamental principles of human dignity. And they should be subject to review. So that means, for example, congressional oversight. So we just had yesterday, or, or this week, I should say, hearings in which the NIH director, Dr. Fauci, testified in the Senate. He also was on self-isolation, but he was blocked from testifying to the House because of partisan concerns, presumably. That is not subject to review. The House has, in a democratic society like ours and under our constitution, an oversight function that the government is blocking them from achieving, and that therefore is a, a clear violation of Syracuse. Now, you might ask yourself, so where did these principles come from and why were they invoked? Well, it's, it's a fascinating history, but just very briefly, Syracuse came out of uh, issues that were occurring in the 70s and 80s where multiple governments were restricting civil liberties under the guise of, or in the name of, responding to emergencies. And they defined emergencies very broadly. Protests are an emergency, uprisings against dictatorship was an emergency, calling for an election, that happened in Burma, Myanmar, was considered an emergency, trying to overthrow a military regime, right? So these are not public health, or other forms of civil emergencies. These are the use of emergency powers uh, for the purposes of repression and for political control. So Syracuse was an attempt to limit the abuse of emergency powers. And that's why it's so helpful to us in this current context. So let's turn now to specifically COVID-19 and rights abuses. Of course, as we all know, there are many, many emerging infections, uh, but SARS-CoV-2 uh, right now is the reality we are all living through the emergence of this uh, severe human pathogen that has led to over 3 million infections and, and an enormous uh, loss of life. So what are common responses? What have we seen uh, both with COVID and with other epidemics? Well. Governments have been responding uh, with an array of rights abuses. The first of these is uh, denial of what is happening and censorship of people who are trying to get scientific information out. Unfortunately, that clearly happened in the early phase of the response with local officials in Wuhan, and it has cost planet Earth and all of humanity dearly that we lost that early period. Right? Uh, Blaming others. This has been a widespread blame game. Uh, unfortunately, our current U.S. administration has been very actively doing this and closing doors, right? Closing down travel and in ways that were not evidence-based and scientific. So we, for example, closed off travel from China while Europe was undergoing an explosive epidemic and we did not respond to that until very late. Governments also uh, do things like arrest people for breaking uh, uh, restrictions on social distancing in an attempt to appear to be tough and responding and doing something. And often those kind of restrictions, and we've seen this in the US where people have been put in jails, which are incredibly dangerous places for exposure because of not responding to social distancing restrictions, 
uh, that is unhelpful. It violates rights and civil liberties, and it also uh, actually perpetuates spread of the virus, as you'll see. Uh, and another example is criminalization of exposure and transmission. And we've seen lots of this in the HIV world, and we're still dealing with outdated discriminatory laws criminalizing exposure or putative potential exposure. And then there's the issue of opportunism. So we, for example, are seeing states that seek to restrict uh, contraceptive services and abortion rights using this emergency in an attempt to pass that agenda. We have seen repeal of environmental legislation. Uh, Indonesia has been engaging in this. The United States has been engaging in it. And stigma and discrimination, which has been widespread, unfortunately. Uh, what do we want to see governments do? Well, if you're truly going to uphold civil liberties and human rights in a pandemic, these are some of the key issues. First of all, recognize we always in the human rights world look to see who are the most disadvantaged by gender, by race, ethnicity, which has already emerged both in the UK and the US as a, a unfortunately a major issue in a health disparity in this response. Migrants, detainees, people who are in prison. This has been a lot of the work that I've been doing, my group has been doing, I'll talk to you about this in a moment. Uh, we need to engage and support communities, not stigmatize uh, communities. Lift barriers to access to health care. So in an emergency, uh, we should not be saying only citizens of country X can have access to COVID testing. Everybody in our geographic space needs to have access to COVID testing, irregardless of their immigration status or nationality, right? That's good public health, and it also upholds human rights. And rather than close down information and deny and censor, these kind of pandemics are moments of heightened need for transparency and accountability because we're asking the public to go along with restrictive measures that are disruptive to life and to economies. And they're not sustainable if we're not transparent and accountable. So let's talk a little bit about some of these abuses of emergency powers, uh, denial and censorship. Many of you will know that one of the first whistleblowers, uh, one of the first people to speak out about COVID uh, as it was emerging in Wuhan uh, was a young doctor, an ophthalmologist actually named Li Wenliang. Uh, he initially uh, saw some cases in the hospital in Wuhan and thought this looks like SARS. And this looks like another one of these emerging pneumonias. And so he shared those concerns in a private manner on social media with medical school classmates. Hey, I think I'm seeing this again, right? Which uh, was, uh, of course, an entirely appropriate thing that astute clinicians uh, worldwide uh, are encouraged to do. Uh, but in China, social media is monitored very closely. And instead of uh, hearing from the public health authorities, would you please tell us about what you're seeing and what, what are the symptoms? Instead, the security forces showed up. They took him uh, into, uh, not into um, custody, but to uh, a security force center uh, and made him sign a public statement that he was making false comments and accused him of disturbing the social order. He signed the statement, went back to his hospital, uh, continued to see patients, uh, and of course, subsequently uh, died of COVID disease. Uh, he was uh, just 35. Um, so uh, this is an example of censorship, and it is also both a human rights violation, uh, a violation of medical ethics, but very importantly, it's terrible public health, right? <laughs> because this meant uh, that, of course, we lost critical early days of the emergence of this virus, and we still know less about that early emergence than we should. Here's another example. Cambodia, a uh, Southeast Asian nation, a low-income, low- and middle-income country, uh, Human Rights Watch put out a report uh, that it turned out that 
Cambodian authorities were arresting people for concerns, voicing concerns about COVID-19's impact, calling it fake news, um, and also <laughs> arresting members of the opposition party, right, and putting them in detention. So um, this is not a response to an epidemic, right? And, and Human Rights Watch's response is the government should stop abusing people's free speech rights and instead focus on providing the public accurate and timely information about COVID-19. Arresting and shutting up people who are raising concerns is again, bad human rights practice and it's terrible public health. So we all share another right and it's really an interesting one. It actually is in the Universal Declaration, uh, again of 1948, and that is that we all have the right, all human beings have the right to information and to benefit from the outcomes of science. Now, why was that put in the Universal Declaration? Well, the Universal Declaration was actually a response to the Nazi era atrocities, also Japanese atrocities in World War II committed on Chinese uh, uh, prisoners of war. And of course, in the case of the Nazi regime committed against Jews, gypsies and, and other Roma people and other uh, groups targeted by the Nazis. And in both cases, human experimentation was done on people without their consent, obviously, but more importantly, from this perspective, was also done uh, without any uh, uh, possibility that the people being experimented upon would benefit from the outcomes, if there were to be any outcomes. And that established a, a principle afterwards in 1948, that this should never happen again, and that if anybody participates in scientific research or medical research, they have a right to be the first to benefit if there are benefits accruing from that. But this has now been interpreted more broadly and more widely, that we actually all have a right to benefit from the outcomes of science. So this is in Article 27, we have a right to share in scientific advances and their benefits. Uh, and now here's an example of a denial of the right to benefit from science. This was from the middle of March. Myanmar uh, continued to deny that COVID-19 was happening. And then the government spokesperson, when asked, why is it that you are not responding to COVID, said that we have no infections in our country and it's because of our lifestyle and diet. Um, he also said that because people pay with cash instead of credit cards, the virus would not spread in the country, right? Now, that is irresponsible. That is factually inaccurate. That is a denial of science. And the problem with it, in addition to being, uh, looking on the face of it now, so absurd, is also that it gives a false sense of security. If the government is saying, we don't have this disease in our country and you have nothing to worry about and you will be protected by lifestyle and diet, why would people self-isolate? Why would people with cough and a fever uh, seek medical care and stay at home unless they think they're really sick, uh, but potentially, of course, infecting others? So uh, this is an example of the denial of the right to benefit from science. The same thing, unfortunately, has been happening in Russia. And in the case of Russia, this has really cost them because they lost the early and middle period of the response. And of course, now uh, are the second most affected country after the United States, right? Um, so the Kremlin has played down the seriousness of the threat. And as late as March 26th, a Kremlin spokesman said, there is de facto no epidemic. In the meantime, Russian hospitals and healthcare workers were scrambling in the middle of a very serious epidemic, right? That is obfuscating reality and denying science. So uh, unfortunately, uh, this has also been a feature of the US administration. So Free Press, which uh, monitors the uh, press, um, uh, actually filed a suit with the FCC saying uh, that the, uh, Trump administration's misinformation and disinformation, particularly coming out of the president, um, actually was a violation. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and their petition was denied, essentially based on a First Amendment argument that this would interrupt uh, freedom of the press. 
So here you have some rights competing against each other. But I think the, the free press organization statement is really interesting. And of course, they quoted President Trump on some of his famous factually inaccurate misstatements. Anybody that wants a test can get a test. Still not true in the United States. The United States has tremendous control of the coronavirus. We still have the largest number of cases and the largest number of deaths worldwide. If that's what tremendous control looks like, we're all in trouble. Uh, and that the virus is just going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle, it will disappear. So that is a dangerous message coming from a leader. It's unscientific, it's not the case, and it violates all of our rights to benefit from science. Right? And this was done in the face of you know, what is arguably one of the great biomedical scientific enterprises of the world. Uh, there really is uh, no commensurate entity that invests in science and, and clinical medicine in the way that the National Institutes of Health do, for example, or CDC, or FDA. Uh, so we are being denied, actively being denied, the benefit of all of that science. So let's talk also then about vulnerable populations. And I wanna focus on a few because one of the aspects of COVID-19 that has been so striking is the remarkable infectivity of this virus in closed environments. So that's been true in nursing homes, as uh, many of you will know, and rehab facilities. It's been true on cruise ships and on naval ships. But it also was a prominent feature of the Wuhan outbreak. One of the first aspects of the Wuhan outbreak was that it broke out also in detention prison facilities. Uh, and so prisoners and detainees, refugees, undocumented migrants are particularly vulnerable populations given COVID-19's epidemiology. And they are, should be and must be prioritized both from a public health perspective and from a human rights perspective. So I think UNAIDS, the new director of UNAIDS, put out a very nice statement on this. We'll just I'll read highlights of it for you. But as we know from HIV, uh, HIV epidemics exist in an unequal world. They feed off existing inequalities, hit the most vulnerable and marginalized, and those who have no access to health care, who have no social safety net, who have no right to sick leave, who have no water to wash their hands. That actually is a situation in many detention facilities. The people whose right to health are denied are those who are hit first and hit the hardest. So we looked at this from the perspective of undocumented US immigrants and COVID-19 uh, and Kathleen Page, who's been a real leader in this area at Johns Hopkins, associate professor, uh, her group and myself published this piece in the New England Journal. Um, I'll just quote from it. For undocumented immigrants calling their doctor is not an option. The Affordable Care Act excluded undocumented immigrants from eligibility. So 7.1 million estimated of these people in the U.S. lack health insurance. Uh, they don't have a primary care provider. Uh, and we are already seeing, unfortunately, disproportionate burdens in this population. So this is one example of a group who are excluded from healthcare. Remember, when we talked about Syracuse, that, that part of the response to an emergency is that it must not be discriminatory. To discriminate against somebody based on their immigration status or their legal status within a country is again, a violation of a fundamental human right to access to healthcare, but also terrible public health. Because if you're excluding a whole group, a significant group of people, 3% of the US population is undocumented migrants, uh, then you are going to have really serious problems achieving epidemic control, as indeed we are. Now I want to talk about detention. And this is particularly important uh, for uh, if there are uh, other US citizens on the phone. N not everybody knows that the US has been engaged for several decades now in a, uh, an effort that has been called mass incarceration. We have more people uh, in our uh, jails and prisons and detention facilities than any other country. 
uh, 2.3 million. It's an extraordinary proportion of the U.S. population and another 36,000 or so in immigration detention. We also know that these facilities, and this is true in the US and globally, have a long history of infectious disease spread. TB, MDR-TB, influenza, MRSA, hepatitis B and C, and now of course COVID-19. And as I said earlier, this was a prominent feature of the COVID outbreak. Now, we're all being recommended to reduce spread, to practice social distancing, to avoid crowds of more than 10, to practice good hygiene. Think about those things if you are in a prison, a jail, or a detention facility, right? Second issue is that these facilities are woefully ill-prepared to handle ill or critically ill patients. Uh, and so the burden uh, uh, on them, particularly, this is a real issue with, with uh, county jails and, and immigration detention facilities in rural areas, that the communities around them are ill-prepared to handle those patients as well. And so our position from the beginning and many others has been that we must reduce overcrowding, that every effort should be made to reduce the detained population, and that no one should be being held or newly jailed in the COVID context for things like unpaid fees and fines, for failure to make bail, uh, for immigration violations. And really the only exception for these are people who are deemed a flight risk or a threat to public security and safety. And we have an enormous number of people in the US and it is true globally, who are in detention for these kinds of issues. Often in the US, it's failure to make $200 bail. If you think about the cost of one of those people needing to be on a ventilator for two weeks, this is a ridiculous policy from a public health perspective, but also from a cost, uh, cost, uh, costing it, uh, perspective. So we've been very involved. We've now filed uh, uh, cases in 11 states uh, and the District of Columbia. Um, and there have been widespread efforts in some states to address this issue. I won't go into all of these in detail because we don't have time for questions, but just to say uh, many, many states and municipalities have been trying to do this. It's been too slow and the numbers have been too small, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it, it has been responsive to the epidemic. Now, we had a challenge in our own state in Maryland because our governor, who has otherwise been, been thought to be doing a, a very solid job and listening to the experts and listening to Hopkins faculty who were on his COVID advisory committee, uh, nevertheless was dug in on this issue and was not willing to uh, do prison releases, jail releases, and reduce the population and incarceration. So we did uh, a piece in the Washington Post to try and press him. There's a link to it here. We were positive uh, about the rest of his response, but uh, basically encouraging him. His name is Larry Hogan. Larry Hogan can lead by addressing COVID in prisons and jails. And many of you will not know the names of my other co-authors on this, but Marilyn Mosby is the state's attorney general for Baltimore City. Uh, so this was the city putting pressure on the governor. We also did a letter uh, that was drafted by myself and several other colleagues and signed by over 200 Hopkins faculty calling for the governor to, uh, to make this move and begin to reduce overcrowding. He finally buckled under the pressure and did this on April 20th. He signed an order to release hundreds, 800 uh, inmates, not enough, but nevertheless uh, a positive response. So, um, let me, let me just say one or two other things. Um, first of all, we've done a follow-up letter uh, on April 30th asking him to do more uh, and to do universal testing, prisons and jails, and also to release more people. Um, we've been uh, had victories, I'm happy to say, in immigration detention. 
in Texas, where a federal judge agreed with our uh, affidavit asserting that uh, immigration detention could not protect people. Uh, and we also just had a big win over the weekend in South Africa, where I've been working with the prison authorities there. Uh, and 1,900 people have been released from prison and detention in South Africa, uh, again, to respond to this issue of reducing overcrowding. And South Africa, like many African countries, has an enormous number of people in pretrial detention. Uh, waiting a court appearance and sometimes waiting longer for a court appearance than their likely sentence would be. So that is, uh, again, a human rights abuse. It's terrible public health, uh, but it also is a really a failure to respond to COVID. So we're, we're delighted that we've had some victories. In the next phase of the response, I think we're going to see some new challenges. And I just wanted to highlight one. This was a piece from The Scientist putting forward the idea that there may, for example, be antibody-based differentials in how we, uh, how we go about going back to our lives as people begin to reduce social distancing. Uh, and this group of ethicists, for example, is putting forward that those with low or no titers of antibodies against COVID uh, would not be allowed to return to work until there is huge immunity, herd immunity, or they are vaccinated. Well, herd immunity is a very dangerous concept that's going to take a very long time. And uh, Tom Quinn and I have both been involved in the effort to develop an HIV vaccine. It's been going on for more than 30 years, and we're not there. Uh, so this, I think, is going to be a new frontier of rights. Who has had COVID and, and, and has evidence of antibody? Who doesn't? Uh, and this, again, uh, although it may be an important principle, if it turns out that antibody actually turns out to be protective, we don't know that uh, yet from reinfection. But on the other hand, it is potentially fraught with rights abuses, right? And there have already been countries, Italy and Spain among them, who essentially have been arguing that they're going to, you know, issue passports even based on antibody status. So we have to be vigilant that the next phases of the response are likely uh, to also have these kinds of social justice, human rights issues. Um, and again, we must, I think, use the Syracuse principles to test these. So for example, right now saying that COVID antibodies are a basis to return to work does not meet Syracuse because it's not evidence-based. We don't know if antibody is protective and if people can be reinfected. Until we know that, making decisions based on antibody status does not meet scientific principles and it doesn't meet the human rights basis. So let me summarize by saying a couple of things. First of all, uh, global pandemics, as we all know, are public health emergencies and Rights and liberties can be restricted uh, with the public health goal of achieving epidemic control. But these powers can be abused, and we have the Syracuse principles to help guide us in thinking about how to prevent abuses. We have fundamental rights to protection from infectious diseases, and we all have a right to benefit from science. And that, I think, is very fundamental. Finally, uh, misinformation, disinformation, denials of severity are not just threats to human rights. They are also threats to public health, and they're going to undermine the pandemic response. And so we really have to be vigilant about these. And I'm sorry to say uh, that uh, if I were a judge, and I'm not a judge, but if I were, I would have to judge the U.S. response as truly having failed on this misinformation, disinformation, denial of severity front. Uh, and that has cost us as a country, and that has cost immense human suffering and loss of life. In an emergency, human rights demand that we pay special attention to the most vulnerable, to the least among us, and to the people whose liberty we have restricted, people whose liberty has been restricted in our name. I think that that is a fundamental principle, and that's actually the last thing I'd like to leave you with, uh, in addition to thanking many people who've helped uh, me think through these issues, my own group at Hopkins, uh, Tom Inglesby, uh, 
Glenn Rubinstein, Josh Sharfstein, a number of others, and also collaborators in uh, health and human rights, uh, Joe Amen, uh, Drexel, Rick Altice at Yale, uh, Adiba Kamarulzaman in Malaysia, Jody Rich, who is really a great expert, um, and Sonia Kumar from the ACLU of Maryland, who we worked with on uh, prison releases in our state. Uh, and with that, uh, I will stop and, uh, and hand it back to Tom. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, unbelievable presentation. And it's clear that COVID, in all its ramifications, has really uh, touched upon the human rights issues of our um, right to health uh, and yeah. how we interface with governments and uh, public health officials and and, and the like. And you, you really did a, a very comprehensive overview of that. Questions have been coming in. I actually haven't answered them because you're the expert and you're so good at, at these. And some of these you have already touched upon, uh, but I thought uh, to some degree it would be worth repeating a little bit uh, or at least amplifying. Uh, and so I'm going to, you, you can go along with me. These are out of the Q&A. But the first one I thought, uh, it was at the very beginning of your talk. Uh, and I don't know if you want to amplify mm. on this. But how do you really adequately balance the human rights in the time of a state of emergency, like preventing COVID transmission, without repression? Uh, and let me bring up an example. I mean, let's take China. Yeah. Uh, because when they did their lockdown and they wanted everyone to wear a mask and they were locking people in their homes, I, there were many in this country that said that's repression. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, I, I, think, I think I would say that the Syracuse principles are the framework for helping us think about that, right? Yeah. So, for example, there is a legitimate public health concern about reducing social interaction and about having people stay at home. No question about that. There is not a legitimate public health concern in forcing doctors to sign statements denying what they've seen, right? Yeah. And that cost China and, and it cost the world and it arguably cost Dr. Lee his life because you know, they also were not providing personal protective equipment because they hadn't accepted that an outbreak of another respiratory virus was underway. Mm -hmm. By the way, his wife also got infected and also ended up in intensive care and she was pregnant. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think that to me is just a very clear example of, on the one hand, restrictions that are evidence-based and on the other, restrictions that have a political intent. And the unfortunate reality, this also happened with SARS uh, in China. Um, it's also happened with, with HIV in the famous outbreak in central China uh, among paid blood donors um, where collection equipment was reused, is that local officials are often the people who are restricting information. And the reason why is because nobody wants to send bad news to Beijing. And they don't want to be seen as having, you know, not been able to control it at the local level. And that is a part of the way their political dynamic works. Um, and remember, you know, that these are not, of course, elected officials. They are not beholden to the population that they serve. They are beholden to Beijing because they're appointed by the party. And, and so that, that means that local governance is very centralized in China, uh, and this has been a problem for them in the past, and we saw it, unfortunately, again with COVID. Yeah, no, th and thanks. I, I want to touch upon, uh, towards the end of your talk, you talked about immunity certificates. Mm. Here. And um, I have a colleague uh, that I communicate with in Germany, and, and I don't know who's on from Germany right now, but I, I was told that, you know, the central government was going to issue these immunity certificates so they could get their economy up and going and, mm -hmm. and so forth. I, I was told just this week that that has been put aside and it's been given to their major ethics committee, uh, which is sort of what was in your slide. 
Um, yes. That, that I don't know if you want to expand on that, but I was so pleased to hear that because yes. talk about discrimination that was going to set up uh, a precedent for discrimination. Yeah. 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 Well, I would say, first of all, um, I agree that it's important that that go to an ethics body because it is an ethics issue. But you want to be sure that there are some infectious disease <laughs> people and people with expertise in antibody and immunity on that panel because the science is out on this. It right? is. I mean, yeah. oh, yeah. No. And, and that again is fundamental to the human rights principles, right? They are not in opposition to science. That should totally be understood, right? It is, a, it is a principle of human rights that they have to be based on science. Yeah. So until we know uh, that antibody is protective and which kind of antibody and with what assay <laughs> and with what confidence, right, that we have in that assay, it's too soon to be making public policy based on this, however much politicians would like that to be the case, right? Yeah. You can't force it. Uh, some rapid fire ones. Yeah. Hey, Chris, uh, is it a violation of human rights if a country closes its borders to block neighbors who happen to be complacent about the epidemic, i.e. not wearing a mask, not doing things? Right, uh, right, right. What, that, and, and that brings up an example. It can be country to country. Or it can also be state to state. Rhode yeah. Island was screening New Yorkers uh, that were traveling through in the beginning of the epidemic. What do you think about some of this? Yeah, I mean, I think from a rights perspective, again, we go back to the issue of legitimate public health concern, right? There are certainly cases where there is a legitimate public health concern. Uh, there are others where, you know, this has proven to be very discriminatory. So I'll give you an example on the U.S. southern border, right? Uh, there, there's a, uh, people moving back and forth all the time. There are truckers going back and forth all the time. There are workers going back and forth all the time. But the administration blocked asylum seekers. Now, what is the public health rationale for that? Right? Is there any reason why a person seeking asylum would be more or less likely to have COVID than a truck driver? There isn't, right? So that's discriminatory. And that what that is, of course, is not a legitimate public health effort, but rather an immigration policy objective masquerading as public health. And that's when it becomes discriminatory and a rights violation, right? So, you know, with, with the original SARS outbreak in China, that began in the city of Guangzhou southern city and again in another one of these wet markets where there were mixed wild animals including bats and civets and others very similar to the dynamic with Wuhan um, and that city was closed they closed down travel and no one was allowed to leave they quarantined it in the same way they did Wuhan with one exception and that exception was party members members of the communist party were allowed to go home to Beijing right? And it ended up, what city in the world had the largest number of SARS deaths in the end? Beijing. Beijing. Yeah. I so that's discriminatory in the opposite direction. Yeah. Right? You can't privilege a certain class of people and say, oh, uh, you don't have to wear a mask because you're a senior political official. Right? I mean. Yeah. That, that happened to hit the name when, when uh, <laughs> Vice President uh, Pence was uh, touring the Mayo Clinic. I, I, that didn't make any sense. Precisely, right? And that it also is bad messaging, right? There also is a messaging component to public health that we leaders need to model the behavior we're asking others to adopt. Um, another question, is it a concern, and this one I'm kind of sensitive to, okay. concern of denial to access to other uh, health care, oh, I just lost it, uh, hold on, <laughs> it, it moved, uh, concern of denial to access to other health care services, like family planning, reproductive health services, chronic care, among others, in the name of COVID. Um, isn't this a human right concern? And have countries lost more people due to lack of such services than deaths due to COVID-19? 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, that's going to play out differently in, in each country. And there are certainly places, at least for now, that appear to have relatively low burdens uh, from COVID and to have a relatively small number of deaths. Thailand, a uh, country of 70 million, has fewer than 100 deaths uh, at this point that, that have been documented. Um, uh, so there'll be a lot of variability there. But there's no question uh, that overly restrictive uh, 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 measures that block access to health care for other issues are not called for and can really lead to uh, loss of life, interruption of services. A great example is, you know, delays for which, uh, like delays in cancer chemotherapy, for which time really does matter, right? Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that, that's an important one. Um, the balance here, of course, is that there is a legitimate concern in trying to keep people out of healthcare facilities who don't need to be there when healthcare facilities have COVID-19 uh, underway, uh, and particularly in the early phase where not everybody is prepared. Um, the, the huge challenge there in so many places, and it's been a big one in the U.S., particularly early on, uh, is ensuring personal protective equipment, that's very fundamental, um, and setting up systems whereby, uh, you know, people can, for example, get COVID testing and not have to be in an emergency room with lots of other people. And, you know, so, so there, are, there are multiple aspects to this, but there's no question that just a blanket closure of healthcare services uh, for other conditions doesn't meet the, the Syracuse principles, uh, it's overly restrictive and it does potentially violate people's right to health care for other issues. Mm -hmm. um, right. You can't stop providing obstetric care for women giving birth. Yeah, exactly. Right. It, it's something that we're going to uh, obviously monitor. I, I do research on sexually transmitted diseases mm -hmm. and I got to tell you that um, one, attendance to the clinics is way down. Uh, and I, we will probably see a spike of STIs um, uh, during this time period. Um, uh, one, uh, there's, there's so many in here that are so good, but one is a comment um, rather than a question, but various UN agencies came out with a joint statement yesterday, May 13th, on COVID-19 in prison yes. and other closed settings. Does this go along with Dr. Byer's message for Governor Hogan? Yes, absolutely. We were delighted to see that. Uh, and they did indeed call for decarceration, for reducing crowding in these facilities. I will say that um, it's kind of late. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it's painful because, you know, we, we understood uh, actually in January that this was likely to be a problem. And the Wuhan prison outbreak was well underway in February. Uh, and we started our advocacy around this issue in advance, trying to say reduce overcrowding so we can prevent these outbreaks. And we failed. There are outbreaks in every uh, penitentiary in our state. Uh, uh, the jails uh, continue to be a problem. Immigration detention has just been horrendous. Uh, and, you know, there is the very real possibility that these places are going to end up uh, having big impacts on community transmission. People often think that prisons and jails are somehow hived off from the rest of society. Nothing could be further from the truth. They have three eight-hour shifts a day. There are constantly people in and out of those places. And in virtually every outbreak that we now understand in these facilities, it's been staff, prison guards, contract staff, maintenance staff, who have introduced the virus into these communities, uh, into these closed settings. Uh, that happened in Wuhan, it happened at Rikers Island, it happened in Cook mm -hmm. County. Uh, and, you know, where people have actually done prevalence studies, the first one was in a, in a place called Marion, Ohio, which has a big prison. Uh, the prevalence was 73% of everybody in that facility. And that's one of the first ones that has done uh, full testing. 
Um, so, uh, you know, that, that is about the transmissibility of this virus if you do nothing, right? The yeah. estimate is that the 50 to 70 percent of a population will be infected. Um, so that's why we're so concerned, and we were delighted to see that. And it was UNODC, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, WHO, UNAIDS, huh. uh, all, you know, coming together. That's, that's great. You know, we're getting uh, to the end of the, our hour, um, and I, I'm going to sort of close with two here. How ethical is it that a vaccine manufactured by one country may not be accepted by others? I mean, that goes yeah, without yeah. saying. I, we're going to have to vaccinate 350 million people in, in this country, never mind the number of people globally. Uh, we're going to need as many vaccines and as quickly as possible. For That's right. And by the way, when we do have a vaccine, undocumented migrants are going to need access to it. You should not have to have a, a photo ID or proof of residence or citizenship. Yeah. Right? That would be discriminatory. That would be, yeah. Uh, um, ditto for people in closed settings, right? You know, yeah. there's no reason that prisoners should be last in line. They're the, actually the most at risk. So think about those things. I would also say um, that COVID is going to test a lot of things. One of the things it's going to test is global health governance in a big way. Uh, and the fact that we have a, a WHO that has been the subject of attack and controversy, you would like to see WHO as the kind of neutral global arbiter of all of this. Uh, you know, the, the UNICEF has a long storied history of being kind of the lead international uh, uh, organization for childhood immunizations. Uh, we are going to have to rebuild that global solidarity. Uh, and we could end up, unfortunately, in a, in a real firefight, particularly if we have multiple partially effective vaccines, which <laughs> could happen. Very uh, much. That will, well, it'll be a happy day when we have some options, but yeah. nevertheless, uh, the global health governance aspect, no question. Yeah. Why don't we close on this last one, uh, mainly okay. because it underscores okay. uh, a lot. Why don't we see more ethicists in the global and national panels discussing all of these um, uh, type of issues about COVID and have more webinars? This is the first one that I've seen addressing these human rights issues. So it's sort of a compliment to you. Okay. All okay. you can well, say is you're glad to <laughs> be I've able to be a part of this. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, go ahead. Uh, well, as, I, as I said earlier, uh, it's really been striking to me because I've been doing a lot of advocacy and media and talking with all kinds of people, uh, both in the U.S. and internationally, how few people, for example, are aware of Syracuse, know that there are principles for thinking about this. Uh, yeah. How few people have appreciated the role these issues have played in earlier pandemics. It's as though we haven't learned from the response. Um, so I will, I will just say um, that I, I agree that it's, it's been uh, uh, underappreciated aspect and it will continue to be. Yeah. And we need to work on that because uh, each phase of this response is gonna raise new challenges. Um, and you know, the previous question about vaccines is a great example. The antibody issue is a major one. Uh, the whole issue of schools and, and how that's going to work and science there and the right to education. And you know, there, this will not cease. Uh, and, and I'm delighted that you think it was valuable, whoever has that question. <laughs> Well, it, uh, it was extremely valuable. You were great, Chris. I mean, you covered a lot of ter territory in a very short period of time. I want to tell everyone listening in, all of this, this session's been recorded um, by this afternoon. It will be on the Center for Global Health website. Great. You'll be able to uh, um, uh, I see it there. Um, some of the questions, we'll try and make sure they get passed along. Uh, and uh, I want to thank everyone for joining in. I do know that for people who are still online, that 
Come next Thursday, a week from today, we'll be having a discussion on the use of convalescent plasma, hmm. not only in the U.S., but in low- and middle-income countries, and Evan Block uh, from Pathology will be uh, the presenter for that. We may have one also on Tuesday, but stay tuned. Megan uh, Harrison will uh, send that notice out. But Chris, once again, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And well, thanks, thanks, everyone, for joining in. Thanks, Tom. I very much enjoyed it. I appreciate it. And I'm delighted that you're putting out this platform. It's really a wonderful thing. Right. Thanks, Chris. Have a great day. You too. You too. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Bye-bye, everyone.